Well, hello again, and welcome to another online Bible study with Pastor Bill Brown. This is for our Sunday morning services, and we're looking forward to sharing with you the Word of God. We're going to be talking about Jesus, the greatest subject on the face of this earth. And we're going to be looking at him in particular as our prophet, our priest, and our king. We're going to be looking at three sections of scriptures, first one coming out of Acts chapter 3, where we find that uh, he shall send, meaning God will send Jesus Christ, which before you was preached, notice verse 22, he was preached before of Moses, and Moses truly said unto the fathers, a prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren like unto me. Him shall ye hear in all things whatsoever he shall say unto you. We already get the idea from that, that he's going to come from uh, Israelite family. He's going to come through one of the tribes, and we know he's going to be a prophet, a teacher, a spokesman. He's going to be speaking to man on behalf of God. He is going to be revealing God to mankind. Then we find him not only as a prophet, but as the priest in Hebrews chapter 3. And verse 1, Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. What a wonderful truth to be able to study out, that he has an unchangeable priesthood, that he has a reconciling priesthood. He reconciles us to God, and he is ever interceding on our behalf for us. Then in Revelation 17 and verse 14, couldn't find a greater verse to speak to us about our great king, where it says, These shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them. For why? He is the Lord of lords and King of kings, and they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. He is the one who has dethroned Satan. He rules now, and he awaits that future kingdom. These three passages introduce you to Jesus Christ in his mediatorial offices as, as our prophet, our priest, and our king. In fact, it's interesting. You go back into our articles of faith and to the historic articles of faith over into London, England, and the uh, Baptists there uh, wrote in 1641 about 12 different articles having to do specifically, and that's not the end of the subject matter, but very specifically as our prophet, our priest, and our king. So we're going to be looking at these mediatorial offices of Jesus Christ, and we want to look and investigate just using one word, and that's why. Why? Why? Did God give us these titles? Why these terms to describe Christ and his work on our behalf? As our prophet, of course, already mentioned, he's our teacher. He reveals God to us. He reveals redemption to us. He reveals to us the forgiveness of sins through his name. We need his ministry in all of these areas. He is introduced as the God-man. He is introduced as the man, the only name given under heaven whereby we must be saved. His name, his ministry, his mediatorial offices as our prophet, our priest, and our king are the only means by which we can overcome our deficiencies, our disabilities, and our defects as fallen sinners. Without Christ's mediatorial offices, Man is going to remain in a state of separation from God. We aren't even aware of our problems while we're in that state. What we're going to begin to look at, first of all, is that man is blind. He needs, he's, in fact, he's unaware of his blindness. If you look at Acts 26 and verse 18, it talks about opening our eyes and turning us from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God, 
that we may receive the forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. It is because of Christ and his ministry that we can see, that we can know, and that we even have hope. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 18, I'm not going to put that up on the screen, but it says the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. It is the Son being made the flesh or being made flesh. That's how we have those mediatorial offices that in fact when we go back into the gospel of John that Christ became a man, yet he was without sin. He was made man that he might reveal God to us. He's the only way that God can be revealed to us. The word, verse 14 says, was made flesh. The word that was God was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Down to verse 9 in chapter 14, or excuse me, chapter 1 and verse 18, it says, No man hath seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. Then we go to John 14 and 9 in response to Philip's question, how are we going to know the Father? (laughs) Jesus told Philip, he says, he that hath seen me hath seen the Father. We are in great need. We are in desperate need of the ministry of Christ because we are in our natural state blind. But please note that we need his ministry as our prophet and our priest and our king, not only because we are blind, but because we are bound. When we look through the scriptures, it talks about the state of men after we have been saved. In Colossians 1 and verse 13, it says, Who hath delivered us, no longer bound. Romans chapter 6 and chapter 7 deal with this as well that we have been set free from the bondage of sin. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. Man has to be set free from the bondage of sin and from our bondage in sin. Even after we're saved, we have to be reminded of our current state in Christ. The Galatian church was confused because of some people coming down and teaching them uh, some legalism. And Paul had to remind them in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 1, these are already men and women who have been set free. They've already been liberated. And yet he tells them to stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. You see, we were all once captive by sin. We were all, well, let me just read it in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 2, where he says, Where in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Everyone, before we were saved, once persisted in living in conformity to this world and to the prince and the power of darkness rather than the righteousness that is of the world to come. In fact, in our natural state, we are not fit to live in that coming world of righteousness. We must be changed. We must be made to fit. And that's what our prophet, our priest, and our king does when he raises us from the dead, he gives us new eyes. He liberates us to live a new life. He gives us a new will, a new hope, and a new direction. Also, what he says in Ephesians 2, 7, that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. 
it is through him that Colossians 1 and 22 says that we will be presented holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. It is Jesus Christ and in his mediatorial offices as prophet, priest, and king that you and I are made spotless, that he frees us from the pollution of sin and he frees us from the power of sin. Man, how sad is that? Is unaware that he's blind. Man in his natural state is unaware that he's bound. And man is unaware in his natural state that he is banished. Man is banished from the life of God. Man is banished from the worship of God. Man is banished. Well, let me go back to that verse in chapter or Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 18 where we're talking about being banished from the life of God, it says, having the understanding darkened, notice this, being alienated from the life of God through ignorance that is in them and through the blindness of their own heart. That's our real problem. We are blind and we are hardened. We've banished ourselves in that sense. We've banished ourselves from discovering the way of salvation, and we have banished ourselves from discovering the life of salvation. We need the prophet, the priest, and the king because we have been banished not only by sin, but because of sin and being locked into sin. Once we are renewed, once we have put off the old man, once we have put on the new man, once we have put on that new way of life and holiness, we're no longer banished from living a life that is pleasing to the Lord. I won't take the time to go through all of it, but in Ephesians chapter 4, he deals with the fact that once we put on that new man, which after God has created in righteousness and true holiness, then, go down to verse 32, he says, We can learn how to be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another. Here's the key, forgiving, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. We need to understand even the fact that in this being involved and the caretaker of these mediatorial offices, I'm not saying that quite right, but it is the idea that Christ set himself apart. He sanctified himself to this work through the everlasting covenant as our mediator. Well, let's read it in John 17 and verse 19 in the high priestly prayer. He says, for their sakes, I sanctify myself that they also might be sanctified through thy truth, all that we might be set apart to his glory, set apart to his purpose, that we might be set apart to glorify him, to honor him, and that our lives might so shine that others might see our Father's good work and glorify our Father which is in heaven. You see, our mode of operation, if we've been saved, is now different. We were once banished from the life of God, but now we've been reconciled to him. We've been made into the family of God and have become, I should say, sons of God. Dude, we're no longer banished from true worship. You see, man thinks that he can simply approach God on his own. He thinks that he can kind of clean up his act that he can reconcile himself to God on his own good works, but that can't happen. That must be done through the work, the mediatorial offices of Christ as our prophet, our priest, and king. It is then that you and I can worship in spirit and in truth. Prior to that, you could only worship God in form and in ceremony, but your heart was far removed from him. That's what was the problem. With Israel, oftentimes, we wore the rags of the old man. 
But it's in salvation that we've been provided with the robe of righteousness through our prophet, our priest, and our king. We were once locked into the world of shame and guilt. But now, instead of that, we're no longer banished from the presence of God. Look at Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 and 20, where he says, Having therefore, brethren, boldness. Ha, we're no longer banished to a life of ignorance. Let me go back to that verse again and make sure that we've got it down. Brethren, having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiness by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he hath consecrated for us through the well, veil, that is to say, his flesh. You and I are not only granted entrance, but we are granted entrance with boldness to enter at any time that we have need. We are no longer banished to a life of ignorance. We are no longer banished to a life of insecurity, of uncertainty. We are no longer banished to a world of isolation. We're not alone. Let me show you in Colossians 2 and 23 where Christ in his ministry to us has banished that life of ignorance, insecurity, and isolation. Look at what it says, that their hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love, and unto all riches of the full of assurance of understanding, to the acknowledgement of the ministry of God and of the Father and of Christ, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Instead of having to remain in a life of uncertainty and be filled with doubts, to be alone apart from everyone and having no hope, we have been brought into the family of God. We have been knit together in love, not only with him, but with the other children of God. You and I can find others that are just like us and we are all discovering the riches of what this grace means through his mediatorial offices of Christ as our prophet, our priest, and our king. In him, look at that, is hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. In Jesus Christ, you and I, every single believer, there isn't anybody that's excluded from this. If you're saved, then you have all and you can find all you have need of in Jesus Christ. You can learn all that you have need of learning in Jesus Christ. And it's in him you will find assurance, comfort, and peace because he's reconciled us to the Father. It is in Christ that every believer finds all that they need and all that they need to know and all that they need to comfort themselves. The same again is true for every believer and we can encourage one another as we greet one another as members of God's family as how that we are all recipients of this grace that we find in his offices. The same riches, the same treasures that are available to every believer. Jesus Christ is your prophet, your priest, and your king gives you the hope for forgiveness. And by that, that's not a wish. That hope is a confident expectation. That means it is an assured realization. We have hope for the power to overcome sin and hope that we will see him upon his throne. There's nothing greater than to think about him, not only as our prophet and priest, but as our king. He told us to how to pray. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We're looking for a day when that kingdom will come in its fullness, that we will see him in and on his throne. His kingdom is coming, and our king will be revealed as the king of kings and lord of lords. In Hebrews chapter 10, let me just finish with this verse. At, but this man, 
after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God from henceforth expecting or waiting until his enemies be made his footstool. He's waiting for the day in which all the kingdoms of this earth will be turned over to him by the Father, and he will rule and reign for a thousand years. And at the end of that, his kingdom won't find an end. The enemy will be completely destroyed, and his kingdom will be ushered in where there will be no opposition in his kingdom. Let me just ask this in closing. Has Christ healed you of your spiritual blindness? Has Christ liberated you from your bondage in sin and from sin? Has Jesus removed your banishment of ignorance, insecurity, and isolation? My dear friend, if you were a believer, that's exactly what you have in Jesus Christ because of his ministry, his mediatorial offices as our prophet, our priest, and our king. May you seek rest in him, security in him, and sight through him and of him. Lord bless you.